Welcome to this episode of the Comedy Defects Podcast. My name is Winter, I'm a comedian, and this is my show. Those that are new to the show, welcome. Those that are old to the show, thanks for coming back. This is episode 91 with a very funny comic called Aaron Hood. Aaron's been performing for many years and his material is quite dark. I love watching this guy work because he goes to some pretty dark and horrific places, but it's very funny with it too. He runs a great night in Norwich called the Hood and Nanny. It's for charity. I've played it. It's a lovely gig. It's, the audience are really up for it. So if you ever see it happening, go to that gig. And you can find this podcast. We're on Facebook. We're there. We have a page. You can go to Twitter. You can follow me at Winter Dominus. I'm also on Instagram at Winter Dominus as well. That's Winter, D-O-M-I-N-U-S. Now, if you like this podcast enough and you feel like you want to donate, just go to Patreon, type in The Comedy Defects Podcast. or donate as little or as much as you feel this podcast is worth. And if you can't donate, that's okay. Just tell your friends about your favorite episode or go to the podcast app and leave us a nice, honest review because it tells people where we are and what we're up to. But I hope this episode doesn't find you as I am in the middle of a winter malaise. You know, the nights are getting longer. There's not much light. So get yourself a sad light, eat some nice food and relax. Listen to this great episode with a really good friend of mine, Aaron Hood, for episode 91. It's like, you know, that clinic in Israel where um, they treat mental patients, but specifically everyone who thinks that they're Jesus. There's like 50 people there who think they're Jesus Christ and they mingle with each other. I want to see like footage of that of that institution like you lying fuck just pick <laughs> just got some more out do it no no you do it do it if you're the messiah do it <laughs> it's like, yeah it's like you you, you try to turn the water into wine come on here's a fish and ship supper now make this into five thousand meals yeah okay it's a bit like the um the gordon ramsay sort of uh, show with jesus isn't it really off you go all right see if you can make this last uh, and, and your what's what would your restaurant be called um I I'd call it the DWP in the no matter what you bought, like they give you absolutely fucking nothing and that's all you can eat for the week. Okay. Political commentary. Subtle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck Boris Johnson, yeah. I mean yeah. this probably dates everything now, but no, he's probably gonna be in the government somewhere anyway, so it doesn't really date anything. It's like fuck yeah, fuck him, fuck him, it's fine. We've just finished the Christmas and how was your Christmas? Oh, it was great. I did I did absolutely nothing. Like we were sort of ferried to my parents' house, had Christmas dinner, opened presents, and like, oh shit, we best take you back now because we didn't fancy the fine or anything. Uh, and I've been playing a bit of, you know, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. Is it any good? It's, it's pretty decent. There's only been like I must have got like really lucky because there's only been two kind of minor glitches. I honestly I spent twenty minutes customizing my penis. Because you can do that, and you and you can have so many penis custom customizers, but you can only have one preset fanny, which is a bit lame. I wanted like to make the labia so big you could catch flight, you know. Okay, but I couldn't. But but, but yeah, I was just like, that is the perfect dick, symmetrical, tasteful pubis, and I think I spent a, as much time customizing that that I have actually playing the game. I mean, you're just having a second life, really, aren't you? Because you know, when you're, you know, when you first hit your teens, you're like, you spend all the time polishing it for, for somebody. Uh, you know, to hopefully, no, this is going to be worth it. I'm going to get this thing ready for when I actually get to use it. Yeah. So, Cyberpunk, right? I haven't got any games this year at all. I didn't. I didn't. I'm still trying to get through Days Gone. And it's like, I got past a part which I needed to get a gun from, and I don't have that gun, so I'm, it's really hard now. And when the hordes start attacking me, I'm like, oh, well, that's great. I've just got like a pea shooter against a million zombies. This is not going to happen. I can't hit the barrel to explode them to give me a little bit of a chance to thin out the herd. And so it's really frustrating, mate. I'm, 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 I've reloaded it from the save point to try and get to that place again. But it's just like, oh, come on. I like linear games that kind of go... Oh well, you know, you know, rather than the games that kind of laugh at you, you, you got to this bit already. You should have no, you've missed a bit, mate. You you can't possibly go back now. You have to start the game from the very very beginning to get this right. It's such a it's such a troll. Like I remember constantly doing that. Where like in Fallout Four was the worst for it. Where mm. I was comfortably shooting everything, fucking little things up with my katana, yeah. and then I go out and do a quest, and it's like 
a death claw or a super mutant and i'm not ready for this or this yeah. interaction remotely i actually spent and this is no joke three hours on one mission where i'd, I'd go in I could kill one person, one super mutant with the katana. Then I'd have to run away, find somewhere to hide, and then sneak out and kill another one. And <laughs> and honestly, this took three hours yeah. because I just hadn't got anything any good. Number one game on your uh, like your hit list then? Ever or yeah, ever go for the greatest hit then. Honestly, I'd probably say Dragon Age Inquisition. It's um, got enough multiple choice in it that. You know, you have like a lot of autonomy over the story, which is what I like. And you can actually see tangible consequences for what you've done. It's mm. not like Fable where you make the decisions and it's like at the end of the game in the credits, like you did this, which means this happens. <laughs> so, that's helpful, but nothing tangible in the game has changed. Yeah. And you and you can really like piss off or be really nice to um, certain your companions and all that sort of stuff because a lot of people game to be social like with Fortnite, call of duty all mm. of that i game to be aggressively anti-social I, I don't want to see anyone i don't want to interact with anyone in this open world i, I want this this escapism to be mine yeah <laughs> yeah it's your ego it's like the second comedy it's like a comedy for you where you can actually kill people you literally tear them apart <laughs> yeah this uh, this person has displeased me <laughs> exactly start naming them it's like that oh that fucker there i remember you from that gig oh yes <laughs> I, I remember you would not stop interrupting me at the at the open mic <laughs> during quite a difficult bit to pull off mm. <laughs> i will never forgive you for this yeah, you laughed like in the wrong place how dare you laugh in that place the laugh is supposed to go at the very end where the the well-crafted punchline lives how are you <laughs> It's just the amount of times I've jettisoned perfectly good performances just because someone has mildly done something wrong. You're ruining my art. How dare you? What are you What are you even here for? Oh, you're here to enjoy yourself. You think you're here to enjoy yourself? You think you're here for you? No, no, buddy. You're here for me. Okay? It's all about me. <laughs> it's just like you're here to just laugh at dick jokes, basically. Yeah. Well, I'll give you dick jokes. <laughs> yeah. When I'm good and ready, when I've customised that dick joke, okay, that's why I'm loving cyberpunk right now. I must get this. It sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really funny how this commentary on corporate exploitation has some of the most unethical workers' treatment in the games industry. Mm. Sometimes you can honestly feel, you can almost hear the developers crying as you're driving <laughs> around and you're just like... You yeah. see some of the corporate boss characters, and they're just unrepentant dickheads. And I'm like, yeah, the, the, and they and I bet they're trying to convince, like, no, boss, this isn't based on you. Like they had this um, meeting where the devs just screamed at the CEOs, where they're like, did you do you notice any irony of making a game about corporate corporations running amok yeah. in that how you've treated all of us? Yeah. So. I think that adds to kind of the comedy, like this piece of art is trying to make this amazing statement yeah. and it's just been absolutely destroyed of all meaning by like all of the context around it. I just love that. The, the irony just crushes every sort of thing they were trying to do with the, the narrative of the game, yeah? So as soon as you like you, you downloaded it or you like received it in the post, you could like literally smell the human rights abuse from the actual uh, packaging or the actual the internet connection. You're like... <laughs> Well, that point a couple of years ago when um, that entire generation found out all of their beloved entertainers were paedophiles. Oh, man, yeah. And yeah. it was just like, absolutely delicious. <laughs> the pain. <laughs> the pain. Oh, man. Yeah. No, no, my childhood. It's gone. Look, it's gone. It was gone a long time ago. No, but I want to hold on to that. Hey, look at Cobra Kai. No, that's not, it's this, this not doing anything for me. Everyone says that Cobra Kai is amazing. I, I do not like it. I do not like yeah. it. I think it's awful. I think you should ruin stuff for children. Like, did you know that Mr. Miyagi was a massive yeah. racist and <laughs> he <laughs> shat down a puppy's neck? You know, yeah. <laughs> or just stuff like, did you know The Undertaker and Kane are not actually related? Move on. You know, don't live in the past. Keep going. Keep moving forward. Go through. Um, so, so what was so Cyberpunk? Was that your your uh, your present to yourself for Christmas? Uh, that was my present from the rents. Oh, uh, yeah. That and um, I've got a toolkit. Oh, which yeah? just feels like 
such a <laughs> obvious sig- uh, compensation or signifier. You know, like when some a bloke has got no personality and a pretty mediocre at best cock, uh, so they buy like a nice car, and it's really so blatantly an overcompensation. It's just like. I am not a competent man. So I feel like I'm taking everyone for a dunce and a liar, just even owning this now. Okay, what, what can we need to know what, what tool is it? What what did you get? I got like loads of hammers and screws and all of this stuff, sort of stuff, but it's just like I don't think I've been allowed near tools since I accidentally hammered through my own finger in woodwork oh, once. Oh, th- with a nail? Yeah, you know that like bit of webbing oh, in yeah. your, between your thumb and your oh. How did you? I, I, how did? How did you do that? How did that? How is that possible? Okay, right. Because um, um, tr- you need three hands for that. You because you've hammered through. Oh no! You put the uh, but you put it in the f- thumb and forefinger and then aimed the nail accidentally through that same hand, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I had. Oh, no. I wasn't. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> uh, like there was um, the textiles class was like right uh, opposite the room from me and there was a sixth former just doing bits who was like too fit to exist almost that like you you just like this isn't real like i can't be hallucinating like i i I wanted to check if i was i i just assumed i'd got monoxide poisoning you know Mm. that sort of person wasn't looking their their top was a bit low cut whack ow I didn't even go first aid for it. I just sort of, no one really noticed. I didn't want to acknowledge my shame. Just yeah. pulled it out, <laughs> pulled it out and went and, and went to the bathroom. <laughs> okay, well worth it. <laughs> yeah. I just, uh, my school was like really un- unattentive. Like, I don't think anyone got clocked for being a nonce, but mm. it would have been really easy to hide in plain sight there because... Yeah. A lot of the teachers, you know, those sort of comprehensives, there was a few departments that they actually put effort into where they were really good. Or like if you got to the sixth form, they're like, oh, we might actually try and teach these people something because it looks good getting these people to uni. But half the time, it's just, you know, when a teacher has just been worn down by the bureaucracy of the job and they just don't care anymore. It was just all of those sorts of teachers, apart from a few that actually educated me. Yeah. And I almost respected their like blatant disregard for their profession. You know, when someone is working with you and they just don't give a shit so blatantly that you've got to respect it. <laughs> yeah, they they sort of like they don't they're not even there. They, they, they don't wear glasses anymore. The glasses are there as a barrier between you and them. And the tie is just there just in case it's a particularly bad day at school, yeah? That's what yeah. it is, right? <laughs> so, it's, you know, to wipe, it's to wipe tears away. Yeah. So, like, you went to a, was a comprehensive, like, a, just a, a normal secondary school? Just a normal school, because it was literally half a mile away from my house. It, it, it was an okay school, to be fair. It was nice, because it was, like, the only, like, middle school, I was pretty horrendously bullied, mm. because I was on such a, quite a higher level of blatant autism and you know how kids are arseholes devoid of empathy yeah it, it stopped eventually basically my parents started noticing i wouldn't go on the bus and i told them what happened and i got this spiel of even my mum because she hated the kid and they were all like stand up yourself and even mum was like you've beaten him up before why have you let him do this again so i took <laughs> that as a green light to fuck this guy up yeah right? yeah so i I hit him with quite a beautiful elbow and then forced mm. his head in a dog shit bin. Oh, so, nice. <laughs> so um, he left me alone um, after that. But first, and it was kind of like everyone's too anxious and horny to really give anyone any trouble at that mm. sort of age. Yeah, yeah. And I realised I was vaguely funny enough for people to mostly leave me alone. So it was pretty easy experience i kind of figured out that my my main utility in life would be kind of entertainment because i didn't really excel in anything else (laughs) was it it like you just got to laugh away the pain right but by the way i think i've seen that uh that show that uh up at the fringe recently um i got elbowed in the face and ended up with my head in a (laughs) bin of dog shit i've seen that show it's a sad ending it's a sad ending that is yeah (laughs) (laughs) it's better than like my dad was vaguely distant 
yeah. in my childhood and that made me sad. Yeah, yeah. So have you done any full shows about autism or anything like that? Or do you just like build it in and surprise people with your eye contact? I I I, I don't want to be like autism guy. <laughs> But, it's you know, it's the too... worst superpower in the world, right? Yeah, it's it'd like... be the worst supervillain hero. Yeah. In the world. It's just like, oh, what did he do? Like, oh, he broke into the bank uh, awkwardly. Uh, <laughs> awkwardly, <laughs> he didn't stop the robbery, yeah. but he um, he said he, hands he, up he, to everyone, but no one was sure who he asked to people to put hands up because he wasn't looking anyone in the eye. Hands up, yeah. every you know. So it was yeah. like, very did... confusing. Did, did, did he stop anyone from taking money? No, but he did sort the bills into the like <laughs> se- the correct serial numbers before letting them leave. The, yeah, the t- I mean, he lined. He said everyone on the floor, and he lined them up in like height order and shoe size. That was it. It was. Ve- it took a long time, and the police were there, but they were very impressed at his uh, his uh, organizational skills. <laughs> yeah, it's like that guy's getting away. He's like, no, he's playing human Tetris with the hostages. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It's like, you know, that bit of um, League of Gentlemen. Have you ever seen League of Gentlemen? Of course. I've... I love it. Of man. course you have. You... <laughs> and um, you know the doctor who uh, the woman can't pay for a treatment, so he's mm. like, oh, come to my place at this hour, mm. bring a couple of pizzas. And like you think, oh, this is going to be a sort of Weinstein kind of casting couch thing. Yeah. But he just makes them play like Boggle and Hungry Hungry Hippos. Yeah. And the ones that lose don't get treatment, which is just fucking hilarious. Brilliant. I love I love yeah. the League of Gentlemen. Well, it's so better dark. than the American healthcare system, which is just Kickstarter at this point, isn't it? This is true. This is very true. Right, like dark material, quite political. And uh, yeah. you're from Norwich as well, right? That's that where you're uh, originally from. Well, I'm a refugee to Norwich from oh, Suffolk. Right. And oh. if you've ever been to Suffolk, you understand. Okay. You know, like, it's quite idyllic, but I can't afford, I couldn't afford to live there. Like, mm. I couldn't get a house. So, and I'm not living in Ipswich. Ipswich is kind of really incongruent with the rest of Suffolk. It's like mm. having a crack den in the middle of Hobbiton. I, I moved there because there was like, easier to get to gigs, more opportunities, more work opportunities. So mm. it just... Uh, and my girlfriend was there, so, so, so sort of ticked so, all the boxes, really. You live in Ipswich, or you live in Norwich now? Uh, I lived in Nor. I live in Norwich. So, um, yeah. I used to live near Bury St Edmunds, which mm. was basically like a retirement home for farmers. That okay. there's just nothing there if you're below fifty. Right. Uh, like so. So is Bury St Edmunds like Wyndham? Oh yeah, basically the same. Like anything that describes itself as a historic market town right. which is just a nice way of saying shit hole uh, <laughs> uh, uh, is it's just the same town nice. like some of them have a cathedral usually they only have one greg's we have two well done barry i suppose mm. yeah <laughs> and why is why is ipswich a crack den is it like because it's big for drugs down oh, there or something oh yeah or? there's genuinely a massive problem with crack there oh, like nice. prostitution was always there. I mean, it's a dockers town. It's a port town. So, mm. of course, there's going to be plenty of prostitutes. But, you know, like county lines gangs, uh, like, you know, they go start from London and then they just sort of express deliver across that train line all sorts of drugs. They get like 13 year olds to, um, to drop off all these drugs, which pro- means they're probably these gangs are doing a better job at creating jobs and giving these youngsters apprenticeship opportunities than the actual government. The name drug dealer has um, so, so much, so much, you know, bad PR attached to it. I just refer to them as small businessmen, you know. That's true. S- that's true. Support, support your local, I suppose. Yeah, but self-employed. I, that's, that's, you know, that's true. All the albums and movies and games that wouldn't be made without the easy access to narcotics. I wouldn't even say it's a necessary evil. It's a so. It's mostly a social good. It's just there's just a few unethical providers, you know, a few That's bad true. apples. That's true. Unfortunately, there's no proper uh, regulation, and uh, you know, and, and um, quality control is is the 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 only major thing. And I guess that you know they try to diversify their portfolio with, as we say, prostitution and uh, and, <laughs> and people trafficking, and it just mm. gets all just you know stick to one thing. Don't just, you know, focus. Especially They're not in it for the love of the game no, anymore, the, are like, they? Multitasking doesn't work for anyone. You know, that's it. Just do the just do the drug dealing. 
Just do the drug mm. dealing and make that really good. You know, and it's gone to it's gone to Weatherspoons, hasn't it? Too corporate. Like, where, what happened to the mum and pop crack, crack dens we all grew up with? This is very true. That's it. They really cared about their product. This, no one's got the time anymore. It's, it's crazy. The few I've been in, been in to pick up some stuff, you don't stay in there long. They're usually very smelly. Mm. But they all ha- have, for a crack den, a surprisingly expensive TV and games console. Like, there's nothing else mm. of any value, but there's a massive fuck-off telly and a games console every single time. Yeah, uh, but yeah. massive, like, you know, huge telly screwed onto the wall. You know, it's like, well, I don't even have my telly screwed onto the wall. How the, did yeah. you get a drill with your tools this, this year? Uh, I, I, t- I didn't get a drill, which oh. is like, I can have all of these, but they still don't trust me with a, dr- a drill. <laughs> yeah. Well, you did hammer your hand, t- was it to the table or like a, a nail through your hand? I yeah, guess the, slow, yeah. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Eh? This is, this is, you know, you can't, can't rush these things. So yeah. like the, the, the crack den, like what were they playing? Grand Theft Auto you to, sh- to, 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 to just basically, you know, kind of, I love the way, what, I love what you did there, just practicing. <laughs> yeah, but it's basically like, you know, when you have to do personal development days at work mm. or like you're in du- injunction, they just play GTA in Saints Row. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, they, it was usually like Call of Duty, Gears of War, there was one of the guys who really liked Halo. Everyone sort of, we had this like drugs awareness thing where this guy came in and he was like a former cocaine addict. Mm. And he was meant to be one of those speakers, which is like basically, you know, drugs are bad, MK. Okay? Mm-hmm. And he did a really bad job on it because he made it sound like a really great time. If it basically the, the subtext was, oh, I was a businessman. And if you've got a job where you can afford it, you can you can afford that like that lifestyle. It's mm. fine. That, that that's what I took from it. It really backfired. I had to pretend to them because they were they'd ask like what, how familiar you are with drugs, and I was just like, what you mean the crack den that's like just a few streets down the road from the market in Barry mm. Edmonds. Everyone um knows it's a crack den. There and there's very few um, dealers in Barry. Again, part of the reason people yeah. migrate. One of them lived near the police station, which yeah. is just the stupidest thing in the world. Like, yeah. keep your, you know, there's, he took that saying too, too far, didn't he? Keep your friends close, keep your enemies close. No, no, keep your enemies far away. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Ideally, if you've got loads of valuable narcotics on you, maybe just people shouldn't know where you are, especially not where you live. Yeah. That's very true. Oh, there, there seems to be an awful lot of people uh, knocking on that door today. Oh, I wonder what they're doing. Oh, they're just, they're just probably just really friendly, really, f- yeah. yeah. Mm. No one ever yeah, suspects like, a thing. Yeah, they all look, they're all about like eight stones soaking wet. <laughs> Some of them have got open sores, mm. but they're, they're probably just nice dudes, yeah. you know. But, just a very popular man. Yeah, very, <laughs> very, very energetic uh, in, individuals. Um, yeah. I've uh, always found it very <laughs> funny that. But the police seemingly can't catch these drug dealers, but a 14-year-old can find them just fine. That's true. Eh? That is true. Yeah. Just follow the 14-year-old, man. And That sounds wrong. <laughs> yeah. I, I think they've figured out that a lot of these kids are easier to deal with when they're high. The only thing they're a threat to is um, McDonald's, have a few cravings for food, and just sit at home. I, I think that's the opposite of a problem. They're contributing to the economy, really, aren't they? That's what they're doing. Yeah. Um, the lockdowns. How did you cope with the lockdown? The the for, the, the all of them. What did um, you do? What did you do? I've been learning a bit of German. Enough. I want to get proficient enough in German so I can. I don't have to talk to English people when I don't want to. Right. That's the that's the only reason I'm learning another language so I can pretend to be German when I'm with the wrong sort of English people. You know, <sighs> masturbation. It's a given, you know, that was happening anyway. I went for a lot of walks. <laughs> do you, okay, and if we're talking about masturbation, do you now come in, like, German? Do you, like, oh, lose! Yeah, there's, a, a, yeah, there's an oom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a, yeah. Oh, there's, dear. like, a umlaut stain in one of my socks. Oh, nice, all nice. Sorts of stuff. Oh, grammar, na- grammar German yeah, I, jokes. I love it, love it. <laughs> yeah. I've just been... <laughs> i've just been like mostly gaming netflix yeah. I, I do i do an odd bit of writing it, but i've not really felt particularly productive like i graduated yeah. this year finally oh, yeah. um in what uh, uh politics i got a two-one nice. fair play man 
I'm, t- I'm thinking about doing a master's degree, but because, you know, if I can't get a job uh, and I'd rather do a master's degree, get in more debt or never pay back than end up in some shit, miserable job. That way I um, put off the inevitable collision with the real world for another year. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, you know, you might as well pay. It's just like a, a holiday you've just put on your credit card, really, isn't it? A, a year long holiday. Where you future have to... that's future use problem isn't it exactly it's like it's not now i don't think about that to get a, a decent job that actually pays that shit off which might never happen <laughs> yeah the main plan is to get proficient and uh proficient enough in a couple of mixed martial arts and martial arts and self-defense techniques for mm. for when i have to um protect our meager resources and our water purifier from roving gangs of cannibals after the climate implodes that's very true that's my main plan recently to get proficient enough at violence to pretend to like defend what little i have left after there (laughs) at that point so what are you thinking of uh getting proficient at like a krav maga or like uh, MMA or what? What just a mixture of all of them? You're gonna just do a little bit of everything, like a selection box. I'm fairly respectable at boxing mm-hmm. and bit wrestling, but I basically want to learn Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because you can have people who are like weed thin, mm. like choke someone out or like pull someone's knee out of its socket. There was one because occasionally people from ipswich come to bury st edmunds on nights out when they get bored of fighting other people from ipswich mm. or they're bad at fighting the people from ipswich so they think that people from bury will be less hard one of these dudes was this like ripped he just started on this guy walking home this dude was like ripped tattoos mean clearly had a girlfriend that was at least hugging the age of consent laws mm. you know that sort of guy the dude he picked on was just this kind of like nondescript choir boy sort of looking he, he he looked like you know he was still breastfed at 18 sort of bloke <laughs> and um this interaction lasted all of 10 seconds when this guy really effortlessly took this jacked guy down and like he had he had him in an arm bar which is you know when you just mm. keep pulling the arm on the floor and he put and he tucked this guy's hand under his armpit and just bent it at an L shape. Oh. I heard the snap across the street. It was oh. beautiful. Nice. And it, it was that was a lot of fun. Yeah. I was think <laughs> I'm thinking I was thinking I, I I should have probably said, All right, fifty quid on the week guy, mug someone right off. But yeah, I, I think that it kind of, you know, negates some sort of the size advantage. Obviously, yeah. If you find a big guy who also knows jujitsu, it's probably not the best. But mm. yeah, but generally, like people who study martial arts or any sort of um, you know um, violent sport, they look at everyone else differently then because they think, well, this person may look unthreatening, but you don't know what skills they've got lying underneath the hood. They tend not to be dickheads, don't they? Yeah, it's just like it. I have nothing to prove. No, exactly. I, I already do. I do my training. I, I get all this aggression out in the gym or. Or like on the mat, and like you know, I, I don't need to, you know, I've got, I I like myself enough now. I, I I'm good at something rather than like these guys who are just ripped walking around like posers. A great name for a show for you would be Under the Hood. What do you think? I I like that as one. Um, I think that's one under the under the locker. It, it's it's a good pun. A lot of people, especially with the fringe and stuff, what I've realised from observing from afar is that. If you've got a show that sounds vaguely clever, clever people would be like, oh, that sounds decent. Maybe check that out. The one I've kind of been, it's kind of been on ice because I can't really do previews. And I'm getting to a stage where I could preview it, but it was called I Should Probably Discuss This in Therapy. That was kind of the work title I was working with for one. And it's basically not too dissimilar to what I already do. But the main sort of take home from it is basically that the kind of narrative about mental health in that if you have issues or past traumas like Mm. you know a lot of the whole thing is like coping mechanisms or coping with it and like that idea kind of gets on my nerves and it's just possible to thrive and have a really good life Mm. with mental health issues it's not just something you just have to manage and Mm. that's sort of basically the main message of it is kind of like empowerment i suppose Mm. through personal development personal growth not just like physically or mentally but holistically you know you don't have to maybe worry about 
if someone's earning more money than you or there's always going to be someone who's better looking richer bigger dick whatever it's mm. you can kind of like self actualize and find that sort of piece that martial artists find in mm. the, that i've got this thing i'm really good at it uh, really good at it i've implanted meaning into a cruel more of a void of a universe mm -hmm. but myself you know you've you've created that meaning for yourself and i think that's what everyone needs whatever it is you need you need something that's going to get you up in the morning otherwise you're fucked aren't you absolutely man absolutely so you suffer from depression oh uh, yeah um your de depression gone variety anxiety i suppose that's just being british i suppose like anxiety is like lego's my first mental illness start starter kit right. in this country isn't it yeah. and um yeah it's <laughs> I sometimes get like a bit deluded like sometimes I, I um have kind of real delusions of grandeur where like I'm really really up mm. and I think like I'm the best ever and I won't sleep for a few days or sometimes the lows are just kind of really crushing but I mostly like the last couple of years I've I've had like an equilibrium that I you know a state of balance that I haven't really had prior to this like I, I've been very kind of historically ruled by my feelings almost in that mm. I can't temper them. Like sometimes, you know, like you know, maybe take a step back, analyze the situation, chill out. That's kind of been missing. You, you sort of inform, you can be informed by some of your worst impulses and instincts if you're not careful. Your your coping mechanism is just take a breath or how did you come to that point of, of being able to separate yourself from the emotional response it, it's kind of about knowing yourself like mm. oh i'm in this situation i'm going to react in this way mm. just leave that situation or you know if you have the option like friendship or job or whatever if it's not good for you mm. like, i'm pretty good at getting out mm. um going like i'm not going to react well to this like a lot of people think you, you don't have to stay put until things clo you know escalate or you mm. don't have to be the person to get the last word if this is like a situation, what, why why continue it? Mm. And I, I kind of cope with, obviously, because of lockdown, my main coping mechanism has been gone mostly. The virtual gigs just don't give me the same buzz, really, I get when I'm in person. I go for walks, work out, kind of just um, do a lot of things that are kind of isol um, solitary and just... Mm involve quite a lot of peace and quiet because i quite like that sort of I, I kind of relish that sort of sorry solitude of you know just being by yourself not having to have any external stimuli to um uh, to get to give you a buzz mm. and, and you're just feeling i just feel kind of content through that you know that's good man that's good yeah. you're like a, in your 20s as well all right yeah, I turned twenty five on the eighth. There you go, man. That's that's amazing place to have that introspective and sort of meditative view on your your relation to the world. You know, self awareness. It took me a long time to get that. To be honest, I think comedy definitely helped me in that um, self analyzing and I guess um, sort of focusing on what part of of you is the best part. You know, rather than uh, whole, become attached to an image of yourself that you have to keep up in order to to feel content or not lose your grip on you know your own reality you know sometimes you think to yourself right you know everyone's for the underdog right <laughs> when your ego is is being attacked when you're not self-aware like that you know you're going hey leave that guy alone <laughs> and that guy is already you so you get angry about someone to, trying to destroy your reality and then that takes over and then all that matters is you winning that situation and that yeah. just is a monster that feeds itself because you're you know you, you sometimes you will fight more for somebody that you you, you that isn't you you know <laughs> than, yeah. than yourself and and that is that can happen within your own personality sometimes which is like what is going on you know why can't i just let that go it's fine it's like you know you put all of this effort into this projection of yourself and it's like, say, like, you spend all of the effort on, you know, having a really nice, like, looking entrance to the house, like, the, 
you know, the front, the walls are gorgeous. All, mm. all this ornamentation, the door is a really nice door. But inside there's like, you know, slurry everywhere. Mm. Everywhere's a shithole. It's disgusting. Mm. Like you spend so much time in this kind of fake performance of yourself that you don't actually, it's hollow. You don't mm. actually work on anything that um, is meaningful. Like mm. there's this saying where you have like three faces, that kind of first face you show the world and, how you want to be perceived and that second face you like you let your close friends and your family in and you can be a bit more unguarded around mm -hmm. them and a bit more honest and the third face like you never really show anyone like you know when you're alone you know late at night or you're just mm -hmm. sitting by yourself and if you that's that's real torture if you can't face up to a lot of the darkness and you know the thoughts about who you really are like you know the, the the feelings you've had like some of the stuff you're really deeply ashamed of it like if you can't combat that or say to yourself like look uh, a lot of stuff may have happened that's now done or beyond my control or mm. i shouldn't be have behaved in this way like you can either let that eat you or you can just go like i'm not that person anymore so yeah. why why let that kind of fester I mean, there's days, even as I suppose saying this, there are days when you just end up walking down the street going, look, fuck off, brain, fuck off, just fuck off. <laughs> <Yeah>. Absolutely. <laughs> I, 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 I sometimes actually verbalize it like that. Yeah. I just have to go, fuck you, brain. Totally. totally. Like, we're not doing this today. <laughs> We've done this already. This is not the time. This is not, okay, everyone's looking at me now. This is definitely, definitely not the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you, I, I can't have an existential crisis. I mean a cost cutter. Yeah. Please don't do this to me. Uh, I, just, I why, just wanted to get a full pack of summer speeds and go home. Yeah. Why couldn't you have done this in Greg's? We would have been perfectly fine in Greg's. Yeah, no one would have noticed this uh, in a wet in a pub, you know? Totally. That sort That's of like well return from World War One face, that like free divorce deep sort of bloke. He's not gonna give a shit, is he? Yeah. So he's already got enough on his plate. He doesn't give a shit about your stuff. Like, that person waits outside Nide Weatherspoons for it to be open hmm. like a cat scrambling at the door for alcohol. He yeah. has got his own problems. Exactly. That show you're honing at the moment, like, I, I guess this really should be in therapy. Was it? Is that, was that the name? Was it? I guess this. Yeah, I should probably, I should probably discuss this in therapy. I should probably yeah. discuss this in therapy. And have you, uh, are you planning, hopefully when other things start, are you going to plan to take this to the fringe? Are you going to do, is there, is there a Norwich fringe anyway? Uh, there's been talk of it. There's an Origin Norfolk Festival, which mm. I'd like to be involved with in some capacity. I've had some email conversations with them. Like mm. They seem quite keen. Great. I've been involved in the kind of like on sort of other people's shows or like interviewed by people mm. uh, for it, but I've not specifically performed for it. But, you know, if I can do some more ones that are more near and affordable like Norwich, Camden, Brighton, mm. uh, those sort of towns where my humour goes down well because, you know, I, d I don't really think I'd go down well in kind of a red wall town in fronted by like someone with a St. George flag tattooed on their F cup moob, you know, yeah. that sort of bloke. Like I'm not being racist, but immediately says something horrifically racist, you know, those sorts yeah. of individuals. You never know, though. You might turn those people. They might be thinking that they're just like part of that crowd because that's the only gang in the town that they can be accepted in. They go, they see your stuff, go, whoa, I was thinking that too. And then yeah. could eventually go, right, I'm going to get this tattoo changed. <laughs> <laughs> a lot a lot of people um, can't be reached, though, I don't think. Like, yeah. Because, you know, like with confirmation bias in the yeah. like, y y you can be explaining something, you can have the facts on your sides, right, but... It's it's not just a, an opinion they have like it's became some sort of pillar of their identity. Yeah. So you know a lot of people I I do this too. Like sometimes I've been in a debate or a discussion where I've just been annoyed that someone just doesn't one hundred percent agree with me. But they don't. It, it's not an objective debate. They a lot of times it can be misinterpreted as an attack on their actual identity mm -hmm. rather than like no I just don't think you're right here. Yeah. I like you most of the time, just not on this, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's it. Like we were saying before, 
they're they're backing their they're they're they've got their mate in their head that's backing that self up. They're like, no, you're not taking this guy down. That's my friend. That's my mate. You can't. That's that's it's my brother. You yeah. know who was actually me. <laughs> yeah. When did you start performing? Then, like, when did you start getting into comedy or or acting? And you went acting as well. I got a B in drama at GCSE, yeah. um, and I've done a couple of sketches, and, uh, but I've not really um, performed. I'd like to do a bit of acting. Wouldn't know where to start, to be honest. I'll probably have a few people to talk to. I'll, I'll, I'll have to see, because um, that would be interesting. That would be a road I want to go mm. down. But I've been performing. I've been doing stand-up since uh, my first gig, actually, was when I was 14. And I did, like, basically from 14 to 19, I had this pattern of, I do a couple of good gigs where most it was mostly in front of my mates and mm. that go somewhere that wasn't my majority of my friends and suck because mm. I was crap. And then it wasn't until I was about 20 where I started developing actual material and not just going on and talking about whatever I wanted to talk about mm. or doing a bad Frankie Boyle impression or just trying to be really, really topical and relatable and that wasn't me or then going completely the other way for another gig and then just starting off when like do you know what's funny shagging a dead infant with a trowel you know it was like nothing in between the two extremes and then i just thought i could actually just sit down and actually write material and it turned out that it went better (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah rather than going for the shock and the horror at the start and then you're trying to win them back for the rest of the few minutes you got on stage right yeah i mean you can go like hard Mm. but it's usually you have to be have some level of prominence to get away with being just a proper edgy says it how it is kind of comic because you know they they want to have a broad appeal they'll book accordingly a lot of the clubs that have stellar reputations can probably get away with taking a few more risks or if you're doing what we did with the hood and nanny we're just deliberately going for mostly weird or giving people a platform who wouldn't really get get it otherwise like what I was most proud of is a lot of underrated local acts giving them, you know, their first crack at headlining or paid MC or paid opener. Yeah. I mean, and and we're pretty good with, um, you know, people who come and do the gig and then we'll progress them because a lot of times progression is just a myth at the expedience of the promoter. But I remember when you came and you performed for Autistic Mayhem, you just wanted to do a bit for a spot yeah. and, and then it just someone pulled out so I just emailed you like Winter do you want to do the paid opener and I'm like yeah sure I'd love to do the paid opener and, and it was just like sorted you know, it's straight. a lovely lovely little gig that actually a really lovely little gig and um, yeah it was just it was, the guys were absolutely lovely mate it was just there was didn't need a mic. It was a really lovely uh, setup room. You did really well, man. Uh, no, it was lovely, mate. It was lovely. I was a bit, you know, I'm not going to lie. I was a bit apprehensive because I wasn't sure. I've never performed to uh, people with uh, autism or on some sort of spectrum before. So I was like, I wonder how this is going to go. I wasn't going to, you know, so I was like, oh, but you're, they were absolutely lovely. Um, yeah. So, a lot of them were, you know, there was a few of them, but a lot of them were just like mates or people who support us, you know. Yeah. Which was nice. We raised like 150 odd quid for for that one so it was a good cause right. and i just i just liked having fun now eventually because i i made a friend who lets me use his mic for the for the gigs and, and helps with me with setup so mm. we have a mic now so that's good brilliant it was it's a nice it's a nice change though you give, get to put a bit more energy into it sometimes without a mic you know but it's great it was really fun when you're 14 man i mean like what was your first joke you wrote light bulb porn that'll get you off in a flash <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> Fourteen. That yeah. is. That's good, mate. Nice little one-liner there. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I wrote it in a physics class when I was Great. looking at looking at someone's tits. <laughs> I don't know why. You just <laughs> eureka moment, I suppose. But sometimes I still do that joke, and it gets a few titters because I just like. No pun intended. I don't even know this is a. I don't even know this is a joke anymore. But I'm gonna use it. Yeah, like I, I just. I've started because I I was doing the same sort of tight 10 mostly and Mm. a lot of similar gigs because, you know, you don't drive, you don't live in London. So it's a bit kind of isolation-y because I'm not, uh, because, you know, you have to get anywhere like 60, 80 quid on the train if you can't get someone else who drives a 10 spot. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) You can't afford it. And I'm not at that stage where I can get paid work consistently, unfortunately. Mm. I, I've just started having fun with it mm. more, more 
you know, adding at least one bit of new material that's a bit silly or weird, like doing this joke about how skimmed milk is made by throwing a stone over the top of the barrel and stuff like mm. that. Yeah. And like the last gig I did was like last Friday before Christmas and um, before it locked down yeah. at Bowling House. Nice. And I just pretended to earnestly believe in Father Christmas. With all of the other stuff I was saying, it just it was just so much fun seeing how far I could try and convince this audience that I was like still basically a child. And I wanted them to perceive kind of the stereotype that like the the last few minutes of him, yeah, he's got autism, but he's just like us and like now going like, Oh no, is he is he special? <laughs> is he properly special? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's I, I love feasting on the cringe sometimes, man. It's it's beautiful. Keep keeps them questioning the re- the nature of your reality, and you know how they should treat you in that reality. Hey, do we? Is it a joke? Is it not a joke? That's that's a great thing to just keep them on the edge of. I guess keeps a bit of tension there too. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> should I be laughing yeah. at this? And then you can just play with it. That's great. Yeah, I've, it's even happened to other comedians, like. Mm. I was in in the crowd at a gig and uh, one of uh, Martin's gigs for Hoomer. It was a small room and I laughed and sometimes I do this like tick thing where I rub my hands together. Uh, the comedian pointed it out and she was like, oh, Aaron's excited. And I went, oh, no, I'm autistic. It's just one of my ticks. So she kind of really tried to explain like, you know, comedians will pick up on stuff like from an audience, right? <laughs> and like she was explaining it to me like I was a fucking toddler. Yeah. And I, 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 I wish I'd had the presence of mind to go, yes, or just something, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, if you're going to talk to me like I'm a fucking idiot. Yeah, yeah that's funny, I, man. I just like, because it, it was this clear, this feedback loop of awkwardness where I yeah. was just like, oh, no, I've, I've been brought up. I, I don't have anything to say. Mm. And then she was like, oh, shit. Uh, and it just it just that that kind of little section spiraled. Yeah. And I, I didn't mean to. I wasn't trying to shit her up, honestly. Mm. It just sort of happened. That's it. That's it. It's a beautiful, a beautiful nightmare for her. You're just like watching this with popcorn, going, "Oh, I wonder where, how, when she's going to stop talking." Yeah. <laughs> oh man, it's oh, great, mate. That's great. It's it's so funny. I think I would have got a, a tamer response if I just like pulled it out and started having a bash. Oh, you yeah. know, yeah. You feast yeah. on the awkwardness of uh, of situations. Are you one of those people that when you're like with your with with people, you just like deliberately grind that that tension to the to the to the nth degree and go oh this is beautiful this is just delicious what look at this person just look at their their whole their whole character just melting away a bit like in <laughs> raiders of the lost ark they don't know how to take this they don't know what to do in this situation like you know the guy with the glasses what, melting <laughs> you know you are the ark <laughs> <laughs> yeah i have the power in this uh, social yeah. situation because you know like the stereotype that we're pretty socially inept yeah you know if people come in underestimating you You've seen like a boxing match where someone clearly doesn't respect the opponent and they get sparked out. Yeah. Um, I, I, but, but also I come from a long tradition of wind-up merchants. My dad's got this very dry sense of humour mm. where like you, he'll carry on the joke and then it will land and he'll probably fuck you up. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you like a few examples of how this trend has lasted for generations. Like my granddad, right? He's diabetic. And every week he comes back with two bags of crisps from the shop. Right. He's only allowed one bag of crisps. And Nan has to hide a bag of crisps from him. Right. And she was complaining at us for like 15 minutes. Now. He always does it. And he's sitting there like with this grin. And I know something's up. And then as soon as Nan leaves the room, he's like, oh, I know. I'd buy the second bag deliberately to wind her up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, it's my hobby. And I just love, and he's like, how long has this been going on, Granddad? Eight months or so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. And, and my dad um, convinced me that tattoos were hereditary and that oh. they would, like, starting at 13, they'd, like, force their way out of my skin and, like, be really painful and last for weeks. Wow. And I believed in that for an uncomfortably long time. Like, he just kept it up so earnestly. Yeah. I could probably have checked it with someone or on the computer, but... He said it so compellingly that it was an absolute genius. I, I really respected that level of bullshit. I had one on my girlfriend, Flora, where uh, she just brought up Mean Girls once. And mm. I have obviously seen Mean Girls. It's a very funny film. Mm. But I pretended not to have seen it. 
for some reason mm. until a few months later i was like oh yeah i have seen it and she was just like you bastard you absolute bastard <laughs> and it was just this joke was three months in the making and it was so pointless. I was so dedicated to it for no real reason. Yeah. That, that's a beautiful thing. You get someone to explain the whole film. Well, tell me what it's about. And they explain the whole thing to you, like, you know, in minute detail. But what about this character? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it's, oh, it's, it's fantastic. Oh. And, uh, you know, you, can, you may be like, you pretend to be, you can constantly just ask, and why is that? Yeah. Uh, just to see how stupid someone thinks you are. Just being like, why? Yeah. <laughs> Because your style is very uh, okay and awkward and dark and political uh, in parts, right? And surreal, I guess. You're a mix, mixed bag of everything, really, isn't it? Yeah, I like to, you know, a couple parts dark, part political, mm. you know, some observational on the side and mm. a sprinkle of surreal. You know, yeah. if, if that's... It's really hard to describe it, you know. I just... I know this sounds very s simple and contrived, but I go up there and if I think I think this is funny and I'm not trying to be anyone I'm not, it usually works, mm. you know? And I think that's... I know a lot of people can be really, really good characters and stuff, but I just don't think I'm skilled enough in that way to keep it up, basically. Mm. You just got to be yourself, isn't it? You just got to find what you like, think is funny and just do it and deliver it and believe in whatever you're going to say. Okay, then, for, the, for you then, question, who... Like, this, uh, uh, as a... As a performer or entertainer, what do you see yourself as in, like, you could be a trade, you could be an animal, you could be a mythical creature. When you go up there, what do you, like, kind of go, right, as a performer or, uh, or like, a, for, a, do you know what I'm saying? For a job, what, what do you see yourself as? Like, some people, example, some people see themselves as, like, a gunslinger. I've had, I've had, also had an it an it engineer as well <laughs> yeah um i'm torn between poltergeists or imp right. because like poltergeists poltergeists don't gen like sometimes they don't actually hurt people they just break shit and mess shit up an imp there's kind of that undercurrent of mischievousness yeah so i think i'd settle on kind of imp in that just i'm up there to cause some level of mischief and even if I'm not getting paid, that's something tangible that I get out of it. Just, just consistent, enjoyable mischief. If that, if that makes, if that's a proper answer to your question. Yeah, that, that's fine, mate. An imp is fine. You, an imp is like a, um, like a, a sprite, like a, like one of the the fairy people type thing, but like a, a more of a goblin esque bent to it, right? Yeah, yeah, like. Just a bit of a, not like proper chaotic evil, but just like sort of maybe chaotic neutral. <laughs> so, a bit like, sort of like a bit like gremlin, but without the, uh, the murder bit. Yeah. Just, just a bit of a, a bit of a lovable toss pot is what you kind of go. <laughs> That's for, nice. That's perfect. Yeah. I think that should go on a poster. I think that should be a quote. Lovable toss pot. That's it. That's <laughs> great. Who do you most admire as a, as a performer? Uh, Doug Stanhope would have to be for me. Mm. I just what he does and um you know like there's stuff even amongst mo uh, comedians and people who are like oh yeah most jokes you know there are some things that are just off limits yeah and he doesn't just bring that up or bring like controversial stuff up for the sake of it he usually has quite a salient point of social commentary or something like that and the skill in it being i think I'm personally of the belief you can talk about anything the fuck you like as long as you uh, are funny enough to talk about it. Mm. I went to see him in Birmingham with a couple of other comics mm. and I never thought I'd laugh so much about Indian gang rape. You know, I just... Mm. It, it, he, the way he, But the way he was talking about it and the issue, and that's one of the ones that, like, oh, you can talk about everything, but definitely not that. That's really one of the most sacred cows, I think, in stand-up, anything to do with... Pedo jokes are fine usually, but like specifically the word rape, everyone gets a bit naturally is a bit like, oh, where's he going with this? Because there's like a thousand and one comics who like, oh, but my one's good and it's not really that good of a joke. You know, the bit's mm. not that the bit doesn't justify you the theme. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, totally. He he's a pro. He's the guy for stuff like that. And um it it, it ticks my boxes of, you know, exploring taboos and stuff like that but also like having a lot of 
salient social commentary and stuff like that. And yeah. um, I think he's essential viewing for comedians, to be mm-hmm. honest. You know, I'd be much poorer for it if I'd never seen his work. And yeah, what about you? Um, I, just... I do love, uh, I love Doug Stanhope, but I also love uh, Jeselnik. Anthony oh, Jeselnik's Jeselnik. brilliant. brilliant. Oh. He is just, uh, I, I loved, there's a couple of, uh, my favourite album of his is Thoughts and Prayers. Thoughts mm. and Prayers are, is excellent. It's like, wow. It's um, probably in my top three of all time, actually, yeah. man. Um, yeah, he's just that, and of course, Doug Stanhope is is number one of the of the of the genre, if you like that that um, dark mm. uh, political satire and is mixed with just excellent crafting. But for like sheer cerebral and craftsmanship, mm. I would say that Dylan Moran is brilliant. Yeah, I Dylan need Moran. to familiarize myself more with him because I've seen him in obviously Hot Fuzz and. Uh, I've seen clips of black books, but I've heard mm. he's one of those ones where everyone I know says, oh, you'll love him. But for some reason, he's just in that backlog of stuff I need to see. You mm. know, at the fringe in 2000 and I think it was 17. I went, I went and I saw a lot of shows. I did my own show, but I saw a lot of shows as well when I was up there. And of all the shows I saw, I, I, I saw his at the end, to, at the end of the run. And, like he was just so brilliant. Like the, the 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 setups were amazing, and the punchline wasn't even needed. You know what I mean? It was just that good. It was like if he just stopped there and moved on to the next thing, it would have been perfect. But he was just it was so dense and and just um that was just it was so skillful. It was amazing to to listen to and watch because you know you see sometimes you go to see a, a, a one of your live performances you really admire and you go yeah that was a good show I enjoyed it and but this one it was just like wow blew me away. It's brilliant. Yeah, you, you remember like everything, and it's not yeah. just like this is a solid performance, but like this is a transformational experience Absolutely. for you. You know, absolutely. For so hopefully when things start moving again, you're going to take that show. The name of the show is. I should probably discuss this in therapy. <laughs> right, great. Yeah. And uh, and you are we can be, we can find you in Norwich and Ipswich and Suffolk in that area um, because of the tears at the moment because you can't leave that. that yeah, that, that. lingering around East Anglia. But right. I'll go. be doing a lot more stuff um, when I can afford the equipment. Uh, I'll be doing a lot more stuff on YouTube and Twitch. Yeah, you know, just to kind of offset that's kind of like creative deficit, if you know what I mean. Gotcha. Yeah, to to make you feel like you're doing something to towards comedy. Yeah, like you're contributing in some way. Yeah. You said last last time I spoke to you, you said that you were in talks with some agents and things like this at the moment. Did that all transpire, or did did COVID destroy your hopes and dreams? Mm, yeah, and um, he gave me a lot of good free advice and stuff. Like, Great. I I got a lot of um a lot out of it in terms of um next steps and things so it it wasn't like a waste of time at all and they were very very good very very complimentary with about my work but uh, it's it's probably just not the right time i think i need more of a platform before it's before anything like that seals the deal but it's just nice to have someone not just immediately tell you fuck off isn't it agreed or do you know what like at least a, a meeting that meeting will stand you in good stead when it, it's the right time for you to have that meeting with the next agent that it will suit you you know you're like okay i've done been done this before you know it's all just pra- everything is practice everything is just like you know okay well i've been in this situation before i know what i want out of this you know rather than like being desperate for whatever it is you can get yeah and also if you have more of these discussions you'll know like i know there's a lot of good agents with very good reputations but obviously there's going to be some people who would try and stiff you it's just the nature of the industry. So I think having that those conversations and having like a literacy of what, what is like the standard in terms of, you know, that their percentage and stuff so you don't get fucked over, mm. you know, like a lot of inexperienced acts, maybe they sign the contract, you know, it's a lot less favourable than um, than they initially thought it was. Mm. Dave Chappelle does a really good bit on that in, in the... Um, he even got Netflix to take Chappelle's show off of it because the contract was so bad and he felt it made him feel used that mm. they would do that to him because he he doesn't really get any significant royalties from that show. And Chappelle's show is like the comedy show, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. I'd check that out if you haven't. It's really interesting. Okay, I've I've seen I've seen the Chappelle show, but I haven't seen that um that 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 that's the new show, the twenty twenty one. 
Yeah, it's right. um, kind of like a clip. He released it on Instagram. Yeah. I'll just send it. I'll send it your way. Right, do <laughs> so where can we find you then, apart from East Anglia? You can find me on YouTube as Aaron Hood. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram at The Old Ball. I'm going to be a lot better with other social media platforms in the future, So, but I'll have links for them yeah. when I get them set up. And what's the uh, Twitch and uh, the streaming service? What are you going to be doing with that stuff? I'm gonna, probably going to play a lot of Cyberpunk. Oh, uh, I've got Crash Band, the new Crash Bandicoot as well. All so, right. you know, I'll probably just uh, be doing that, uh, you know, just whatever games I can get hold of, you know. Crafting your penis, uh, holding it. <laughs> making penis it most... Simulator 2077. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be like just a game on that penis emulator, right? That's what it's going to be like. Uh, That's going to be great. Uh, uh, well, Aaron Hood, thank you for spending time with you for the last hour or so. I've really enjoyed it. Hopefully we can kick together very soon and this lockdown will thaw. And until then, happy new year. Happy new year, winter. Always a pleasure, mate. And that was episode 91 with the funny, black-hearted comic, Aaron Hood. He runs a lovely gig in Norwich called The Hood and Nanny. It's all for charity. So if you ever see that happening, go and support that night. It's excellent to be an audience member and great to play it as a comic. So go and check that out if you ever see that happening in Norwich. It's called The Hood and Nanny. And that's Aaron Hood. Go find him on all the socials. And that's it for episode 91. Next month for episode 92, we've got rapper beatboxer, comedian. He was on Harry Hill's TV show and absolutely smashed his spot. It is, of course, Joe Jacobs. And that is for episode 92 at the end of November, the last Wednesday of the month. Until then, I hope you get some nice food and relax. And also just kind of like, just take a bit of time because the winter is here and it's time to just slow down a little bit and just kind of like take stock of the year and try to work your way back into it because Christmas is coming it's not going to get any more fun the days are getting shorter and you know just just take a bit of time out read a book meditate do whatever makes you feel happy <laughs> don't do any of those things if you don't like it but next month is episode 92 Joe Jacobs check it out last Wednesday of the month we'll see you <laughs>